I never thought I'd see a farm in the city. Just like I never thought I'd see a forest in the city. My name is Raymond Graham, and I've been with Groundwork Elizabeth for about the last eight years. And I started off as just a, a planter, you know, going throughout the town, planting flowers to make, to beautify the city. And we, somewhere along the line, we got some grants to create these urban farms. My name is Jonathan Phillips. I'm the executive director of Groundwork Elizabeth, and I've been the executive director here since 2003. So Groundwork is part of a national network of trusts, we call ourselves, and we build more sustainable communities that are equitable as well. That means work in youth programs, urban agriculture, and green infrastructure. Elizabeth, like many urban communities, is only 11 square miles. We have 135,000 people and 11 square miles. That's 12,000 people per square mile. That's a lot of people. So when you have that many people, you need places for them to live. If you build places for them to live, you're gonna take away the trees and the green cover. It's five to seven degrees hotter, especially on hotter days. It's really, it's really a difficult situation. My name is Ben Preston. I'm a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation where we're partnering with community organizations and activists in neighborhoods like Elizabeth to highlight the ways meaningful and truly collaborative community engagement can create environmental justice for residents who have been unfairly affected by neighborhood disinvestment. These effects are not coincidental or even accidental. They're a result of a long history of racist policies that date back to the 1930s, when the federal government's Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, began grading neighborhoods based on their perceived risk for home loan lending. The neighborhoods that were deemed the most risky tended to be those with predominantly black and immigrant populations. This practice became known as redlining. Today, redlined neighborhoods like Elizabeth, more likely to be home to hazardous waste facilities, have poor air quality, and to be impacted by climate change. What we have found is that redlined communities are usually um, hotter, they often flood, often exist in food deserts. We see lower health outcomes. For instance, in Elizabeth, they say if you live down in the, uh, the housing authority, you're 30% more likely to have asthma by the age of 30. Air pollution is a major issue in Elizabeth, where trucks, the port, and railroad operations as well as toxic sites, have all contributed to an influx of diesel particulate matter contamination, a significant health hazard for the people who call the port home. Diesel particulate matter is definitely a problem in Elizabeth. We're right on the New Jersey Turnpike, and we're in the port of New York and New Jersey, Port Elizabeth. So a lot of diesel trucks come out of here. I knew some youth had have asthma, like including me, I was born with it. And then, you know, I've always had to deal with the low air, air quality since I'm like, I live right next to port. I did some reading and studying with some of my coworkers at Groundwork, and they showed me where the government made these red lines for um, certain areas where poor people live and black topped it instead of putting trees in the neighborhood and causing us to have asthma, strokes, high blood pressure. The lack of tree cover in Elizabeth, combined with the extent of asphalt and other paved surfaces in the city, exacerbates the urban heat island, particularly during summer months. And that heat island contributes to exacerbating the problems of air quality, which ultimately affect human health, asthma, and health outcomes. Communities experiencing vulnerability due to existing factors like intergenerational poverty, neighborhood disinvestment, and high unemployment rates have been more likely to experience the negative impacts of climate change. Decades of disinvestment have also left these communities with fewer resources to adapt to the effects of climate change. 
we've found that a lot of the heat islands and the problems were based in these redlined areas. And we've focused our efforts to uh, change these areas and do what we can do to uh, reverse that a little bit. Um, there's a bunch of different options that can be used to fix that. White roofs, green roofs. We do a lot of reforesting and tree plantings in these areas to help cool them down. So a major effort underway in cities around the world is to address the urban heat islands that contribute to extreme heat. And one major tactic for doing that is through the use of white roofs and green roofs, both of which are designed to reflect more solar energy back into the atmosphere and have a cooling effect, um, absorbing heat through vegetation, which has a cooling effect, and overall, cooling down the temperatures, particularly in the densest urban areas, and trying to counter the effects of climate change and rising temperatures. Behind me is a micro forest that we planted, a small area, 30 by 50. What this micro forest does, it sequesters carbon, it produces oxygen. It's a dense planting that grows at a faster rate than a, a normal forest would grow. It provides habitat, it provides shade, it'll cool heat island effect, it'll help with erosion, it'll, it'll help with flooding issues. And then behind that, you've created an outdoor classroom that can provide education on what this is doing, how this is doing it, and all the things that come along with it and just by informing the community and the people around you, uh, the change will start happening on its own. So one of the things we're focused on right now at the RAND Corporation is undertaking research at the intersection of issues like equity in the environment. And the key goal of this research is to generate evidence and build data that policymakers can use to make evidence-based decisions that address environmental justice challenges and identify useful, effective pathways forward on policy. Data can help policymakers zero in on injustices in their communities like persistent poverty, racial and ethnic segregation, disproportionate environmental stressor burden, as well as the impacts from climate change. We collect data on everything we do here, um, from the amount of bees we have, to what plants we put in the ground, to how much food goes out of here yearly. So in a year or two or three, we'll be able to say we took this land and it was, you know, a potential brownfield and this is what happened when we did it over time and these are the results that we get. Earlier today, I had a little tiny thing in my pocket and I walked around Trenton to see air quality. Um, that little thing then goes straight up to a cloud, which then went straight into my email and I shared with the five other kids. And next thing you knew, we had a snapshot of five blocks of Camden over a one hour period. And the coolest part, I think, is that everyone can participate. The RAND Corporation has developed an interactive tool that allows users to explore some of these environmental indicators within historical redlining map boundaries. Users can select the city they're interested in and explore environmental metrics like health hazards, tree cover, and flood risk within redlined districts. What excites me about this project is that we're trying to make data and tools available to everyone. This project is about pulling back the curtain and allowing people out there in the world, whoever they might be, to explore some of these data, explore some of these relationships, to look at communities they're interested in themselves. So we've got this great program. It was initiated through a climate resilience program through Groundwork USA, and we call it Climate Safe Elizabeth. And what we do is we engage the community in informational meetings. We've got these incredible maps, which have layers on them, showing you impervious surfaces, lack of tree cover, a lot of flooding issues. The redlining is part of it as well. And we take these, these bits and we show it to the community and they become so aware that they realize something's got to be done.
I'm the youth coordinator for Groundwork Elizabeth. I have a range of 15 to 18 year olds. They all grew up living like in the urban area of Elizabeth, going to the Elizabeth high schools. Um, and all the areas in Elizabeth aren't too safe. A lot of the schools aren't too safe. So their transition from school to the summertime, like doing the work that we do is just a lot different than what they're used to. We do some maintenance at this micro farm here. They get the chance to not only learn about policies, but learn about the earth. We come to the farm here and, and we're able to, as well as taking them outside, train them right here at the micro farm as to how you grow your own food, how to cook your own food, how to do different things with agriculture, and it's just amazing. We've been doing like all these cleanups in different parts. We've done cleanups in Elizabeth Port. There was one guy who was like, oh my God, like I'm just so glad that, you know, we're keeping this area clean, like this place like needs to be clean because that's what this town deserves. You know, I think the biggest takeaway that, that we want them to have, you know, the young people involved in environmental programming is that they can see themselves there. Very often as careers are advertised to these young people, they don't show people like them. Um, so I, I think the biggest takeaway from my program is that these opportunities are available to everyone. I'm the youth leader for one of our youth programs, the Mayor's Youth Council. We get one hour of the Mayor's time once a month to have an agenda and to propose any ideas that we might have. I feel like it's important for our youth to know that this is their home too, that they're able to mold it in any way, shape or form they feel like is right. Everything that we do is focused on equity. We wanna make sure everyone's got their voices heard, everyone has the opportunity for environmental justice and they want, we want to hear from them what they need. Overcoming the impact of historical policy decisions requires not only grassroots environmental justice efforts, but also thinking about decision-making bodies that are making policy moving forward. In 2022, the federal government launched the Justice 40 initiative, which sets a goal that 40% of the overall benefits across hundreds of government programs flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. At the state level, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection developed a youth inclusion initiative to inspire interest in environmental careers while promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can change happen? Absolutely. Change can always happen. That is the beauty of who we are and what we do as people, but we need to provide the opportunity. Organizations like Groundwork Elizabeth as well as the state of New Jersey, have an important role to play in addressing historical inequities and environmental injustices. But they also have a big role to play in addressing and planning for future policy and future developments that could have an adverse environmental impact on communities. Governor Murphy has passed EO 23. So now in the state of New Jersey, every single action taken by the New Jersey government has to weigh the environmental benefit or deficit. That is such, such a game changer. We're actually engaged right now with an EPA environmental justice grant where we're looking to reduce diesel particulates by using different types of biofuels. We're studying that right now, starting on it, and we hope to have some pretty good answers shortly. My advice for other communities would be to um, just jump into this and do it. There's many different things. Planting a small garden in the community and educating people around there as to what you're planting and how you're planting it can make a world of difference. What I would like to see before I leave this earth is that people take better, better care of the planet, you know, and I would like to see dozens of these mini farms, you know. Working within our community 
We have to make sure we hear the voices that we need to hear, work with the people we need to work with, and actually make a better community more equitable and more sustainable for all.